Thank you, Claudia. She is one very brave lady. <laughs> Good afternoon. And thank you, Women for Kansas, for the warm, extremely warm welcome. I am so honored to be in the good company of extraordinary women, and of course, the men who love us. <laughs> to Women for Kansas, the Women for Kansas leadership, the 2018 convention committee, sponsors, staffers, volunteers, candidates, public servants, and distinguished guests. I salute you, and I thank you for this honor. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, thank you for being here. That's right. Yes, thank you for being here. Now let's talk about immigration. Regardless of your party affiliation or ideologies, whether you're liberal or conservative, right wing, left wing, moderate, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or Independent, I'm going to ask you for the next 30, 40 minutes to put aside all of our differences. Be absolutely open-minded, objective, about what I call the American immigration problem. Claudia's story is a very good representation of that. But first things first, if we are to have an honest discussion about a problem, we should at least define the problem. I'll tell you what it's not. It's really not about what is or might be the best immigration policy. It's much more fundamental than that. What exactly is this problem? That, I'm sorry, yes, thank you, I, I, no, it's, it's, am I just too close? It's not you. It's oh, not okay, you. thank okay. you, you thank go. you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. What is this problem in which I call, and many people would agree, is an unfolding crisis? So much so that a proposed solution could either make or break a political candidate's aspirations? What is this one hot button political battleground issue that gets presidents and perhaps even our next governor elected? What is it that stokes such fear, panic, division, anger, that causes so much pain, suffering, confusion, anxiety, controversy, fierce debates, incendiary tweets, crude and inflammatory rhetoric, protests, outrage, monstrous policies that are primarily fueled by racism and greed, that results in exploitation, abuse, human suffering, inhumane treatment, and never-ending litigation? The short answer is what we in this room commonly know as illegal immigration. The long but more precise answer is a refusal or inability by a majority of Americans to settle for our generation. Who gets to come here? Who gets to stay? And who belongs here? And translate that politics of immigration at the ballot box. As a nation, and it's confirmed by several of our speakers this morning, is we're governed by the will and desires of a small, vocal, and powerful minority. They have the media, politicians, political donors, and lots of money on their side. 
With that kind of power, they set an agenda on all the issues that affect us. And it is for that reason that the votes and policies we see from elected officials and the proposals by those who govern us very rarely line up with our best interests or the wishes of the majority, the governed, we, the people. You see that on every issue, including immigration. Whether we like it or not, we are heading for a moment of reckoning about the fundamental nature and character of this country for this and future generations. And come this November, if a majority of Americans do not define their politics on immigration by deciding who gets to come here, who gets to stay, and who belongs here, then show up at the polls to vote for those candidates who will stand for our immigration politics. Yes. If we fail to do that, immigration will remain, as it is today, a political minefield mired in contradictions, cognitive dissonance, and a politics of cruelty. It will be a political football to be hijacked by fools, opportunists, tyrants, and demagogues. And that's who sits in the White House today. Yeah. How we, as a people, as voters, as concerned citizens decide who gets to come, who gets to stay, who belongs, is in essence our politics on immigration. Whether you voted for our current president or you love or hate him is really besides the point right now. We have Trump voters who supported this administration's hard line on immigration mm -hmm. until ICE came for their spouses their family members, their employers, their employees, and their friends. We have some Trump supporters who were all in favor of the wall until they realized the wall would jeopardize their land and property rights, not to mention a major disruption to wildlife habitats along our southern border. There were Muslims who voted and advocated for Trump until they found out he wasn't kidding about his travel ban. There were black Americans and black immigrants who cast their lot for Trump, only to realize that our POTUS doesn't really believe in racial equality. There are factory workers, middle class and middle income voters who flipped from Democrats to Republicans in 2016 because they believe the false rhetoric about immigrants stealing their jobs. They got laid off anyway. Their jobs got sent out of the country anyway, and not because of immigrants, so had to learn the truth the hard way. Well, what does this tell me? What should this tell us? That there are Americans, some right here in Kansas, whose politics on immigration are in line with Trump, and that's true, his draconian immigration enforcement policy, his zero tolerance on unauthorized border crossings, the travel ban from predominantly Muslim majority countries. They favor limitations to legal immigrants, drastic reductions in refugee admissions, and of course, they want that wall. But the truth is, there are a lot more Americans tens of millions more who have either not yet defined their politics on immigration, are confused or misinformed about it, or sadly are fully informed but just too apathetic to take a stand and vote. We cannot make that mistake this November. 
the fundamental nature and character of the state of Kansas and the country we want to live in is at stake. And it's going to take every eligible voter on or before November 6th to choose the leaders who are aligned with our individual politics, not just on immigration, but on every issue that affects us. Inaction is not an option. In fact, not voting is itself a choice. Our present experience is evidence that bad voters inevitably, um, excuse me, bad leaders are inevitably elected by good people who choose not to vote. So how do we or should we determine our politics on, on immigration? In other words, how do we as individuals decide who gets to come, who gets to stay, and who belongs? The answer, may I suggest, lies ironically in what you think make us great. <laughs> what makes Kansas great? What makes America great? How do you define greatness? Does making Kansas or America mean going back to discrimination, segregation, sexism, isolationism, legal racism, white power, and a government run by covert members of the Ku Klux Klan? Is that your definition of greatness? Then of course, your politics would be preserving America as a white, conservative, Christian culture society. It would become necessary to put a stop to the influx of non-white newcomers. You would feel threatened by language diversity and non-whiteness. You wouldn't want me standing here. And you would be using immigration as a way to preserve white dominance in every way possible. Yes, that would be your politics in spite of the costs, regardless of how illogical, arbitrary, contradictory, unlawful, unconstitutional, cruel, or inhumane the policy. And when the law or the constitution creates an impediment to your politics, then you would do what is necessary to change the laws, amend the Constitution. That way you can revoke birthright citizenship. You can deny naturalization to immigrants. You can denaturalize those who already are US citizens. You would restrict and reduce legal immigration. You would deny admission of refugees. You would reject highly skilled foreign workers and immigrant workers as crops rot in our fields and farms. Yes, you would do that. And if that is your politics, there is a candidate for you. <laughs> and yes, you will elect him or her. I think this year it's a him. <laughs> and you would allow him to raise taxes and shell out billions of taxpayer dollars to fund the search and the mass removal of millions of immigrants as you stop them on every highway in Kansas. And you would break up mixed status families, not caring what happened to their US born children. You wouldn't care if they were exiled or separated from their natural parents. You would pay for that wall, which we know Mexico is not going to pay for. And yes, you would be willing to tolerate the inhumanity of a zero tolerance policy along our borders, child kidnapping, abuse, and the brutality of a police state where everyone must show their papers. But if this is not your politics, and the truth is, only a minority of Americans, a minority of voters, share this politics. 
for majority of Americans and Kansans. The idea of greatness is not defined by bigotry, but by universal access to a good public education for everyone. Affordable food, housing, health care, good infrastructure, livable wages, jobs for working families, low unemployment, entrepreneurism, safe and secure communities, fair taxes, a red hot economy that allows us to care for our poor, our sick, our elderly, our disabled, dignity, equality, liberty, and justice for all, and an America still willing to welcome anyone willing to work and contribute to making this country a better place. If that is your definition of greatness, which is how a majority of Americans define greatness, why is there such a disconnect between the will of the people and those who hold or are running for office? Let's face it, that it's true that good politics doesn't often go hand in hand with good policy, and sound policy often clashes with shrewd politics. But that's not the case with immigration. A latest Gallup poll, this is dated June 2018 and reported in the New York Times, showed that a record high number of Americans, 75%, that's three out of four, strongly believe that immigration is a good thing for the country and immigration levels should be increased not decreased. And I wrote this down so I could share this. The poll included majorities of all party groups, 65% of Republicans and Republican leaning independents agree. So this is where I say, well, if the American people don't buy into the politics of immigration that would exclude those who want to come here for a better life, who want to contribute to making our country any, a better place to live. Why is it that we don't have politicians who align their politics with our desires? This is where some say, well, we don't have a problem with legal immigrants. The problem is with illegal immigration. Fair enough. Let me address the distinction. First of all, the people we call illegal immigrants today, and I use quotation marks whenever I use the term illegal immigrants, because that's not what I use. That's not my language. And there's a reason for that. The people we disparagely call illegal immigrants today have always been with us. They form our proud American heritage. Secondly, the definition of who is legal and who is not has changed with the evolution of our immigration laws. In fact, I often say legality is a question of power, not justice or morality. The only difference between legal and illegal immigration is not morality, it's a simple act of Congress. What do I mean? Well, well into the late 19th century, there was very little federal regulation of immigration. There were virtually no laws to break. <laughs> Land borders were largely unregulated and guarded, and people without, quote unquote, 
legal status came. They came, they stayed, and they become, became Americans. Do you know what we call today's illegal immigrants back then? Pilgrims. <laughs> Explorers. Colonists. Colonizers. Adventurers. Missionaries. Expatriates. Settlers. They were not demonized vilified, disparaged. These were good, resourceful, industrious people we encouraged to come here. We, we needed a growing and increasingly industrialized workforce, workforce, so immigration was virtually unfettered. And up until 1880, potential immigrants did not have to obtain visas at US consulates before entering the United States. Instead, they would simply arrive at a port of entry such as Ellis Island, where they were inspected and allowed into the country unless they fe fell into an excluded category. For example, um, they wouldn't allow Asians except Japanese or Filipinos. They wouldn't allow prostitutes, paupers, polygamists, persons considered dangerous or with loathsome contagious diseases, persons likely to become a public charge, arnarchists, radicals, the feeble-minded, the illiterate. Well, what do you know? Do you think everybody told the truth? <laughs> if I was a prostitute in England and I showed up at Ellis Island, do you think I would tell them that's what I was? No, they came in, and we would, if they were here today, we would be vilifying our own ancestors, our great-great-grandmothers, our great-great-grandfathers as quote-unquote illegal immigrants. The vast majority of people who arrived at ports of entry were allowed to enter. The Immigration Service excluded only 1% of the 25 million immigrants from Europe who arrived at Ellis Island between 1880 and World War I. 25 million. And now we want to complain about 15, 20,000 at our southern border. Well, in 1882, the first general immigration law was enacted, creating the first immigration bureaucracy. And then the Immigration Act of 1891 established a Bureau of Immigration in the Treasury Department. And then we got the Immigration Act of 1924. Bear with me. That was followed by a 1924 law which established the Border Patrol. And that's when we first started to regulate our borders. That's when we said, we need to do something about the unauthorized immigrants entering the country. And we're talking early 1920s. We had the Quarter Law of 1921, the Immigration Act of 1924, based on race and nationality, favoring Western European immigrants, while closing the door to undesirables, including people from Southern and Eastern European countries. And what these laws did was start to limit immigration. We didn't limit immigrants from Canada, Mexico, and South America. However, they had to pay what was called the head tax, which was a fixed fee charged to each person entering the country, and they had to take a literacy test. So that prevented many of them from settling here. But for the first time, immigrants had to meet certain requirements, either race, literacy, uh, medical condition, in order to enter the country. And what do you know? As soon as we started restricting those who would come here, we developed 
an illegal immigration problem. How ironic. For every restriction passed, we generated more unauthorized immigration by those who failed to meet the requirements. And as laws were passed to keep out Asians and Eastern and Southern Europeans, immigrants affected by these restrictions, as well as those who couldn't pass the literacy test or pay the head tax, began to enter outside the legal system. Let me share some stories from 1925. The Immigration Service reported 1.4 million immigrants living in the country illegally. A June 1923 New York Times article reported by the, commissioner, the then Commission of General Immigration stated he'd been trying for years to stem the flow of immigrants from Central and Southern Europe, Africa, and Asia that, um, that had been leaking across the borders of Mexico and Canada and through the ports of the East and West Coasts. The ports, not Ellis Island, and you all know just how large our West Coast is and our East Coast. How many do you think didn't stop? Any ships didn't stop at Ellis Island? A September 1927 New York Times article describes government plans to step up Coast Guard patrols because thousands of Chinese, Japanese, Greeks, Russians, and Italians were landing in Cuba and then hiring smugglers to take them to the United States. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> um, by the way, there's, I don't believe, personally believe there's anything evil or immoral about immigration. It's a perfectly normal human activity that's been going on since the beginning of time. People move from state to state and from country to country. And we cannot deny the irresistible attraction that this country has and has had since its founding. Isn't that how we all got here? Exactly. The irony is that in our attempt to block a legalization process for certain immigrants, we created and unfortunately, to this day, we continue to perpetuate a growing illegal immigration problem. The answer, though, is not open borders. Please don't campaign on that. It's not unlimited immigration. Days for that are gone. And I must say, it is not the abolishment of ICE, sorry. They too have a job to do. The only rational solution, and I, and I say that, it's not because it's my solution, it's the solution we've used, not in 1986, but as far back as the 1920s. The solution to curbing or reducing illegal immigration, it's not a phenomenon that could ever be eliminated, is to regulate it by a legalization process. If you don't like illegal immigration, guess what? A legalization process will fix it. We have a country that since it was founded has been worth the risk for so many immigrants, the foreign born, and we still do. For as long as we have more jobs to fill than people, we do. As long as America is safer than some of the most violent places in the world, we are. We can expect people to continue to risk it all, to come here, to settle here. It is going to be an ongoing activity, and we're going to have 
to have a legalization process, a mechanism to bring potential immigrants that are outside of whatever legal system we have to come forward voluntarily, be inspected, meet established criteria so that we do not perpetuate this dysfunctional system. It is because we haven't. That is why we have an estimated 12 million individuals present in the United States, some living in the shadows, some not, without proper documentation or accountability. They're not bad people. They're not evil people. They entered or have remained in a country that they've called home, a country whose immigration system does not have a legalization pathway for them. But we have a legalization system, you say. Not really. The fact that we have a growing undocumented immigration problem is because our system hasn't created a pathway, a legalization pathway for these immigrants. Isn't legalization a reward for breaking the law, you ask? Not really. If you see legalization as a win-win, one that benefits everyone, not just the immigrants, then it's a good thing. Who, what civilized country shouldn't want to identify, inspect, and legalize the foreign born already living amongst us? How does that add up to homeland security? Safe communities? What about law and order, you say? We can have that too with a legalization program. There's a place for honorable immigration enforcement officers who are trained and dedicated to preventing those who wish to come here to harm us and remove those harmful elements who are already here. What law and order does not mean though is cruel, inhumane, and abusive treatment for the purpose of making money for our political friends and donors. Law and order does not mean discriminatory policies that have nothing to do with homeland security, but are meant to humiliate, intimidate, dominate, and instill fear. No, we don't need to jail all families and children in deportation proceedings. In fact, jailing thousands of migrants and children, including asylum seekers, is both unnecessary and a waste of our taxpayer dollars. <laughs> Releasing those who do not pose a flight risk because of strong family ties or on condition of bond and so many, at least two concrete alternatives to detention. We had a community supervision and a, a program run by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency as an alternative to detention for families seeking asylum. This administration would have you believe that releasing immigrants while their cases proceed in court encourages them to disappear from the government's radar. That's false. The Family Case Management Program had a 99% effectiveness rate, meaning almost every single person enrolled in the program showed up. Plus, it was fiscally responsible. Compare $36 per day to $319 per day per person for each family in detention. And who do you think you're paying that to? Private detention companies. Another alternative to detention that, that's not been as, as uh, 
I guess, favorable for advocates, is the ISAP. It's the electronic bracelets, or anklets. They're uncomfortable. But I think most families would rather have a monitor than sit in jail away from their family, unable to contact um, attorneys or seek basic social services, be denied medical care. So no, that's not law and order. Some might want to call this amnesty. No, it's not. Earned legalization is neither amnesty nor free. If undocumented immigrants are allowed to come forward with rigorous background checks, security checks, fines if they have to, payment of back taxes if they owe any, we can establish a criteria to say you meet these requirements, you can be an American just like everyone else. They would sign up. But we have denied them that. And not because immigration is a bad thing. I could go on tonight and talk about, or this afternoon, and talk about the benefits of immigration, but I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I don't think there's anyone in this room who thinks immigration is a bad thing. It's always been a net positive for this country, for communities. And you can see that I'm not preaching or talking about open borders. No, every sovereign nation should have its borders. No rational person wants open borders. What I'm saying is we have to recognize that people will come here. We have, I believe, a 6,000 mile combined land border between the United States and Mexico. We have a coastline of about 2,000 miles, a Great Lakes shoreline about the same amount. Um, and we're not counting um, Alaska, Puerto Rico. I don't know about you guys, but I don't know that we'll ever develop the technology or have the manpower to keep people out who are dead set on coming here. And if you want to build a wall, well, you'll have to realize that about 417,000 um, visitors who flew in through international airports in 2015 are still here. That wall wouldn't have stopped them from coming. So no, a wall is a stupid idea. It's one of the dumbest ideas, actually, in the Trump immigration policy, and he's got a lot of dumb ones. <laughs> what about secure borders, you say? Well, we have CBP. We have a militarized border. We have drones. <laughs> we have poured billions in border security. Where did that get us this summer? I called the summer of 2018 the summer of kids in cages, kids in courts, and kids in caves, which has nothing to do with the United States, of course. But that was the summer of 2018. No, it is just too overwhelming of a task. And even East Germany, back in the day, when they had a shoot to kill policy, could not deter illegal immigration. So the myth of a sealed border, a 100% secure border, is just that, a myth for gullible voters who think somehow, now in 2018, we can stop a natural activity that's been going on since 1607. It's not gonna happen. 
What about crime, they say, they bring crime. Well, I'd love to sh share some statistics with you. Um, March of 2018, there was a, 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 an article in the journal Criminology which showed that the arrest rate of undocumented immigrants at 40%, get that, 40% below that of native-born Americans. The homicide arrest rate for native-born Americans at 46% higher than the undocumented immigrant homicide arrest rate. To boot, legal immigrants were even less likely to be in jail or prison. Yes, this is not the criminal demographic either. What about welfare, they say. Yes, taxpayers don't want immigrants receiving welfare. And the truth is, most neither qualify for it nor receive it. The problem, the resentment, is that they have US citizen children who do. Well, how is it as a nation we would want to deny benefits to US born citizens born to immigrants that all other immigrants get. Don't you see an equal protection issue here? And are they really a drain on resources when in fact they paid an estimated 11.74 billion to state and local coffers in taxes, personal, sales, excise, property taxes? Don't these taxes fund the very social services that the meager services that their children actually receive? What drain are we talking about? None of this is true. So there really isn't an argument against letting people who are here, who have formed ties to this community, stay here. Nothing but bigotry. I'll give you an illustration. There's Maria, a lawful permanent resident from Mexico of five years, who entered the United States lawfully, is a working mother, and resides in Kansas with her three US citizen children. And then there's Dorothy, an undocumented immigrant from Canada who just drove across a northern border and, uh, um, on her pickup truck, has settled in Kansas for the last five years. There's a Dorothy in the house, I'm sorry. <laughs> and is a working mother of three US born children. And then there's Jane. She entered the US uh, on a tourist visa from China five years ago and has just bo not bothered to go back. She's made Kansas her home. She has three US born children. She's invested in real estate and dutifully pay, pays all her taxes. And then there's Lydia from Guatemala who crossed the border illegally from Mexico five years ago to escape violent gangs and works at a Kansas pig farm for cash. She and her common law partner, who is also undocumented, have three children born here. They're renting a trailer. All four of these women are immigrants. They're here from other countries. They're physically here, raising families, working hard, paying sales taxes. Every time they buy groceries, autom automobiles, gas, clothes. They're paying property taxes. They're employed. They're driving on our streets, starting businesses. What's the only difference between the one legal immigrant and the three undocumented ones? An act of Congress. Well, my friends, the good news is I'm among friends and we know the truth and we know that we don't want to remove the Dorothys, the Marias, and the Lydia's, we want to welcome them. And the fact that you're here means that you want to make a difference. Yes, we're up against a small minority, but remember, whenever we have been up against impossible odds, remember women had the impossible desire to vote when they didn't have the right to vote, but one. 
Remember when slaves wanted freedom but had no weapons or positions or power or money. They won. Black Americans, in spite of their lack of power, money, or status, overcame Jim Crow. They fought. And we're on the road to winning that fight. So yes, even with impossible odds, united, we can do this. So come November 6, please take your red, white, and blue revolutionary colors and vote.